So I'd often like to call the monastery here a quiet corner, a place where people can get away from the madness of the world. and have the space and have the environment to get their bearings. Because when you live in the world, you start spinning along behind the world. It's so easy, unless you have your own quiet corner inside. And that's the purpose of having a place like this, not for people just to hide away. But they can find this quiet corner in the mind, the part that's not affected by the currents of the world, that's not affected by the spinning of the world. It's not attached to the world. And as a result, it doesn't have any fear by what's going to happen in the world. And it's that quiet corner that allows us to have a basis for our integrity, a basis for our skill and how we approach life so that we're not influenced by what the Buddha called the four wrong courses, or the four ways of going off course. Going off course through desire, going off course through aversion, going off course through delusion, or going off course through fear. In one of his discourses, he said, Arahants are incapable of going off course in this way. These things have no power over their minds. And when we look at the way the world has power over our minds, it's because of these four qualities within the mind. So these are things we have to work to get rid of. In English, they're often translated as four forms of bias, four forms of prejudice. I think bias is probably the best translation. It gives a sense of getting off course looking at things in a slant, doing things in a slant way. It's not straightforward. And the only way the mind can do things in a slant way like this is if it learns how to lie to itself, how to hide things from itself. And its motivation for doing that is because it doesn't know any sense of security greater than this. So this is why we have to meditate, is to find a sense of security within. One of my teachers in Thailand, a woman who was a student of Ajahn Fuang, she was the person I went to in my first rains retreat when Ajahn, I didn't have contact with Ajahn Fuang. She told me one time, there's a part of the mind that's always there, that's totally unaffected by anything that happens. And it's our duty as meditators to find that. As we peel away all the different layers of our involvement in things, our involvement in our thoughts, involvement in things outside. We finally come to this part of the mind, and oftentimes we're afraid of it because we feel that it makes us antisocial or unsocial or unfeeling. That's not the case. It puts us in a place of security, a place of strength. Once you've found that place of security and strength, then the fears that come from being attached to this or attached to that, or unable to even think of something being taken away, so you don't look really carefully at the all the defilements hiding under that fear, just like all the weird creatures that hide under rocks. You don't, you're unafraid to move the rock, and so these things have a chance to fester and grow. We lift up the rock, expose them to the light of the sun, and then they can't stay there any longer. They've got to go. It's because there is this element of dishonesty in our minds, and the reason the dishonesty stays there is because, I said, this fear, this lack of security. Once you have that element of security inside you, then the dishonesty has no basis. There's no reason for the mind to hide things from itself, because it's nothing that it's afraid to take on. This is why concentration is a basis for discernment. You get this sense of stability, this rock-solid sense of imperviousness. Things just don't seep in. That's what enables you to live in the world without getting thrown off balance by the world. The world may be slandered, the world may be biased, but you don't have to be slandered and biased along with them. 
And that way you're safe. You're safe from the things that you might do under the influence of fear or desire or aversion or delusion. And as King Basani de Gosala once remarked to the Buddha, that's, that's the greatest security there is, knowing that you can trust yourself. At the same time, you give security to others. They're security to others. They're not subject to your greed, anger, delusion, and fear. So it's a gift not only to yourself, but to the people around you as well. So this is why we work on the meditation, getting the mind to be solid here in the present moment. It's not just the case that virtue allows the mind to settle down, but once the mind is settled down and solid, it allows your virtue to become more and more solid and reliable too. And it's not just an abstract thought, there's a real visceral sense when your mindfulness fills the body. So that you can allow the breath energy and the body to flow together and form a unified whole. There's a sense that it can't be penetrated. All too often we pick up these weird energy currents that other people radiate. Sometimes you just sit and talk to a person, and if you're not guarded about what you pick up, you come up with all sorts of weird energy. It sounds kind of new agey, but it, there's a real visceral sense that you get when you're meditating and you work with the energy field in your body. You really do feel sometimes that if you're not careful, you can get invaded. Whereas if your awareness fills the body, fills this energy field, you can't be invaded. The image they have in the canon is the difference between a lump of clay and a solid wood door. So when people don't have mindfulness saturating the body, it's like a lump of clay. You throw a stone into a lump of the clay and it goes right into the clay. Whereas if mindfulness saturates, does saturate the body, it's like throwing a ball of string against a hardwood door. It just doesn't penetrate. It doesn't make any impression at all. It bounces right off. So as we live in this world, and all the strange currents that are going around in the world, we have to have a sense of protection. And that comes from this inner stability. The world may spin around, but you've got a spot in the mind that doesn't spin. That's where you take your stand. It means you have to give up a lot of the things that the world holds dear, but you begin to realize that if you hold them dear, you just get spinned, spinned around as well. And the spinning of the world isn't all that innocent. It's more like the spinning of gears on a machine. If you get a sleeve or part, part of your clothing caught in the gears, it just pulls it in, pulls it in, pulls it in. If you don't strip off the shirt or whatever, you get mashed by the gears as well. And again, many times as we live in the world, if you're, we're afraid of having this kind of equanimity. Because we feel that we're not being loyal to the people around us. But putting yourself in a position of weakness like that is not loyalty to anybody. It doesn't help anybody. There's a lot more help to other people when you can have this sense of being a little separate, independent, unaffected by things. Look at the Buddha, all the good he did for the world. 2,600 years later, we're still benefiting from the goodness that he left behind. And yet, as he said, he had trained his mind so that when people followed his teachings, he didn't get excited about it. When they didn't follow his teachings, he didn't get upset. He offered the good. He offered his teaching because it was true, and the people who would who were willing to benefit from the truth, they would pick it up. And it's that kind of attitude, the person who offers the greatest good for the world. At the same time, protecting himself. So this exercise we're doing here, focusing on the breath, getting the breath to be comfortable, letting that comfortable breath sensation spread throughout the body. 
bringing all the different strands of the breath energy and the body into alignment. It's a gift not only to ourselves, but also to the people around us. It's our protection. They talk about taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. This is what they mean. You take the qualities of the Buddha, his mindfulness, discernment, concentration, integrity. And you train the mind so that it can be protected by those qualities inside. That's the true meaning of refuge. When you have that quiet corner that's in the mind that you take as your as a refuge, then you can go anywhere and be safe. As I say, make an island for yourself. The image there is that the world is like a river with all these currents flowing along. And the river imagery is very strong in the Pali and they tend to compare it craving to a river as well. In fact, they say there's no river quite like craving pulls you along like nothing else. And as we meditate here, we're creating an island in that river. So even though we have to live surrounded by the river, at least we're not in the river. And our island is solid enough and high enough above the level of the water that we don't have to be afraid of being flooded away. So the world is is a risky place, but only as long as you've got these risky qualities in your mind, when you can learn how to uproot them, get the mind above those qualities, like craving, attachment, ignorance. You find that there's a, there's a true security. It's the security that comes from our own integrity, unlike the security that's being sold by a lot of people right now. We've got to go out and kill and attack and all those other things to make ourselves secure. That never works. As King Vasanity goes to the of the Buddha, the people who go out and do wrong that way, they don't really protect themselves. They leave themselves wide open. No matter how big an army they had, he said, they're really unprotected as long as they're still engaging in misconduct in body, speech, and mind. But when you have this solid basis inside, you see there's no reason to engage in misconduct. And whether you have an army or not, you're protected. You have nothing to fear from the most fearful thing in life, which is your own mind. The craving in the mind. If you've got an island, it's above the flood. <laughs>